Well, welcome to Bethel. It is a wonderful day out, and I just want to welcome all of our campuses online, Edgemont, and here, of course, in Rapid City. Thanks for coming out today. I want to begin this morning, this Veterans Day weekend, by reading you a story. It says, for eight hours, he prepares his uniform and his mind for duty. Every day of his duty, he gets a fresh haircut. When he is on duty, he will not vary from his command a single step or for a single second, no matter the weather, no matter the hour of the day, no matter the day of the week, no matter the number of people watching, and no matter if no one watches at all. You've seen his picture, he is the unflinching guard, the Sentinel, a member of the 3rd United States Infantry Regiment of the United States Army. The men and women who guard the Tomb of the Unknowns at Arlington National Cemetery, and just outside our nation's capital. When a Sentinel comes on duty, he walks exactly 21 steps across the tomb, representing the 21-gun salute, the highest honor given to any military or foreign dignitary. When he turns, he faces the tomb and remains in that position for 21 seconds. He turns again and walks 21 steps across the tomb. And when he completes the short journey, he stops, turns towards the tomb, and pauses for another 21 seconds. Over and over, the sentinel repeats the process until his shift is complete. When the job is done well, it is nearly impossible to discern any movement of that young soldier's head or weapon. With an average age of only 22, these young enlisted men and women with ranks ranging from only private first class to specialists prepare for weeks to take a turn at the tomb. They'll be assigned by groups by their height. No more than two inches will separate those who take responsibility for duty shifts. And yet somehow, all of the sentinels seem taller, straighter, and just a little bit prouder. Strict training ensures that the guard will be unflinching and unwavering in duty, no matter the heat of summer, no matter the driving rain of December, or even the freezing snow of February. And most importantly, the guard will remain posted, and his steps will remain perfect, even when there is not another soul in sight, when no one is watching to see if the sentinel remains diligent at midnight. For this is the point. Inside the Tomb of the Unknowns at Arlington Cemetery are men and women who gave their lives for the freedom we know. Surrounding the Tomb of the Unknowns are more than a quarter of a million graves of others who gave their lives in service to this country. And around that single cemetery are thousands upon thousands of cemeteries in the United States and around the world where the bodies are reminders that our freedom isn't free at all. Instead, it came with a fierce and terrible price tag, and such sacrifice is worth a 24-hour guard, seven days a week, 12 months out of that year. So what is it that makes these soldiers so unique? Why do we take a special trip out there? Why do we take out our cameras and take pictures of these soldiers? It's not their uniforms, they all look the same. But there's something inside of them, maybe we would use the term grit, tenacity, there's something that compels them. They know that they're doing this for a bigger purpose. They simply do it for the honor of doing it. It's some invisible force inside of them. Their audience may not be seen and yet they continue to live out their duties. Now the Bible talks about this invisible force, not just for freedom fighters, but for us as Christians. And if I was really honest with you, many of you have come to myself or Pastor Jared or Pastor Keith or Sean and said, life is going really hard this week, this month, this year. As a matter of fact, I was just stopped in Target last week and someone said, you know what, Melanie? 2017 is the year from hell. It's terrible. It's not just one of you, it's, it's many of you are, are understanding that, are feeling that. So I want you to know that you have this treasure. If you wanna turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter four, it's gonna be in the New Testament, it's gonna be in the second half towards the back, or of course it will be up on our screens. But the Bible says this, it says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. 
And Paul kind of continues on that stream. And so I'm gonna jump down to verse 16. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. And if you're taking notes today, on the back of your worship guide, there's a space for you. Write this down. The treasure has nothing to do with the jar. The jar is nothing more than our human condition. It just represents something that's weak and frail and fragile and easily broken, right? Paul describes it, he, he, he describes it later on in the chapter, uh, in 2 Corinthians, in the book, he's writing to Christians and he says, three separate times, I was beaten 39 times with 39 lashes. He says, I was beaten with rods, I was shipwrecked, I was stoned and left for dead more than once. I was left starving, I was imprisoned. Paul knew suffering. He knew heartache. He knew hurt, he knew physical pain, he knew suffering. And some of your suffering might have names like cancer or this illness or that illness and, and maybe it doesn't have a name. Maybe it's just a feeling, something that's stolen, that joy, that life and light that used to be inside of you that is no longer there and you can't totally describe it but we all know suffering. And Paul didn't just describe physical suffering. He says, I was perplexed. There was some mental struggles going on in his mind that he couldn't just work through. It didn't shut off when he tried to go to sleep at night. We can relate to that, can't we? He said, I was persecuted. He was emotionally struggling. We can relate to that, can't we? Sometimes this life robs us of all the good that we thought was inside of us. But it says, we have this treasure in our jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Our jars are weak and we constantly live in this struggle, this place of weakness but God's remarkable power of God inside of us. And the truth is there's no formula for suffering. One suffering isn't greater than the next. One person's issues aren't worse than the next, but we all can understand suffering and pain and heartache. The truth is sometimes people suffer because of the sins of others. But I want you to know that God did not endorse that, initiate it, or cause it. Sometimes people suffer because of self-inflicted misery or sin. We are our worst enemies. Sometimes people suffer the grief of loved ones getting sick or dying. We don't understand why. Why does God take some people and leave others? We don't know. But I can tell you that Jesus also suffered that grief. And when his loved ones died, it says he wept. He felt that same pain inside that we feel. And sometimes we suffer because we have a vicious enemy who is out to steal, kill, and destroy anything that is left beautiful in our life. But you have this treasure. And the Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, it says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And that's exactly what it's talking about. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he has put the himself, his treasure inside of you that is greater than any surpassing power of this world. And it's not an ordinary power. It's different than any kind of power we talk about. It's not even visible usually. It's not that lightning bolt shooting from heaven, right? That's not who God is. He's usually quiet and peaceful, and he comes in quiet ways. And yet what is he accomplishes through that power is amazing. Amen. But this is the dichotomy of what we live in, in our jars of clay. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We might be perplexed, 
but we do not have to be driven to despair. We might be persecuted, but the Bible says that we will never, ever be forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We might always carry in our body the death of Jesus only so that the life of Jesus can also be manifested in our bodies. This is how God expects us to live. It takes our weakness in order to have his strength. It's something cracks it open to reveal who God really is, but we don't wanna hear that. That doesn't preach very well. It doesn't get a whole lot of amens, right? We want a life free of evil, protected from the dangers of this world. We wanna walk through untroubled, calm, peaceful circumstances. But I need to tell you this, embrace that weakness so that the power of God can be visible through your life. It's not the end. Sometimes it feels like the end of that struggle, that pain, that overwhelming pressure or sickness can feel like an end, but it's not the end. You have this treasure. And if you're writing notes, write this one down. This treasure compels us to speak. Pastor Jared mentioned it just last Sunday while we were having church, an entire church was going through circumstances we can't even imagine. A few weeks ago in Las Vegas, a terrible massacre. And thousands of us posted on Facebook or Instagram, pray for Vegas, right? We didn't have to be there, but we shared in that suffering. If their hearts hurt, our hearts hurt, because somehow it connected us to them. We felt just a small amount of the pain that they were feeling. We share in our sufferings, and the truth is that suffering actually invites us to be human with each other. It's not our perfection, it's not our smiles, it's not our good-looking clothes, right? It's suffering that connects our hearts to one another, but it doesn't just stop there. If you read any of the stories of Vegas, or even the church last Sunday, they talk about the bloodshed. They talk about the overwhelming fear. They talk about all the heartache they felt, but they almost always finish the story with a rescue, a calm that overtook them, a hero that stepped in, someone that shielded them from the storm. They can't help but share that resolve. So we don't just talk about our weakness to say, yes, I'm a victim again. Woe is me, see my life, it's just terrible. It always is, this is what always happens. No, that's not why we share in our sufferings. Many of you heard it said, we share our mess to reveal God's message, right? God might give us a test only to reveal our testimony. And the Bible actually says, in the final book it says, that we overcome by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus did on the cross, and the words of our testimony. It's time to start speaking out the testimony of what God has done in our lives. We might not know why God allows suffering. We don't know why God heals some people and doesn't heal others. We'll never know it. It's not our job to know, it's not our job to explain why, but there's some things that we can stand on. God is love. It's not just what he does. It's not just a one-time event, it's who he is. He can't do anything else but God is love. You need to know that there is nothing too broken, too crushed, too destroyed, too sinful that God cannot redeem or restore. That's his job, he's in the business of that. Read just one, one, any of the stories of the Bible and you'll see that God took broken, sinful, messed up people and did amazing things through their lives and he can do the same thing through your life. God has always used suffering to make us stronger. The Bible actually says he makes beauty from ashes. Pastor Jared's talked about it before, that he made us the image of, his, of himself out of dirt. It's a pretty amazing God. But we also know that God told us to comfort one another. We are God's hands and feet of grace. It's not our responsibility to explain why or how or what if this could have happened. 
We're just called to weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn, and rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And sometimes the only way that we're gonna remember this is by talking about it, by sharing it. We share in our sufferings and his sacrifice. Life isn't fair, but you are not alone. And if you're taking notes, write this down. That treasure inside of us reminds us of our eternal home. This life is temporary. We don't know when it's gonna end. But think about this. When the weakness of our body gives way to death, the very first thing we wonder is, is that person in heaven? What's happening to them now? We immediately think of, of the next life. If you look at verse 10, it says, I'm always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might be manifested. The life of Jesus always rests on the death of Jesus. That's the exact opposite of this world, isn't it? Because this world tells us you live and then you die and that's it. Hope you lived it well. Hope you were kind. The end. But the Bible says you die and then you live in a glory far surpassing anything we can imagine. Listen, your jars are weak. They might be cracked. This world is hard and it might press down on you. But I'm just gonna tell you that there is not enough alcohol in this world that can hold up your jar. Yes, I'm being very personal and very direct. There is not a secret sin that can numb your jar and your pain long enough to hold it together. But there is a treasure inside of you. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's a treasure inside of you that can hold you up. There's nothing externally that can do it, but Jesus can do it inside of you. It has to come from the inside. This is why Paul says in verse 16, we don't lose heart. Our outer self might be wasting away, but our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Life is hard. This world is evil. Pain stinks. But God is good. And he is faithful to finish the work that he began inside of you. And I just want to read a quote that I think sums it up really well from a Christian author, and she says this. Every wrong will eventually be made right. Every injustice will be overturned. Every tear will be dried. All the torn places, pieces will be removed. Every prayer utilized to bring us another inch closer to Jesus and more in partnership with his love. This earth and realm will be repossessed into glory and God will have the world he dreamed of. Some redemption will be in our lifetime but all of it will be in eternity. And as we close today, before we take communion, just to share in Jesus' sufferings, can I just pray for you? Because I know some of you are the ones who came to Pastor Jared or myself and said, this is hard, I don't know if I can do this. Suffering is real, suffering is terrible, Pain it can be overwhelming, but we have this treasure. Can I pray over you? Jesus, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your love. Lord, would you just strengthen us? Our hearts, our minds, our physical bodies, Lord, whatever our suffering or our pain reveals, Lord, whatever is going on in our mind, would you just renew it and heal it by your presence and your power? You are good, Lord. Remind us of that all the time, no matter what our circumstances are telling us, that you are greater than the one in this world, and we have it, you, inside of us. Holy Spirit, come and just comfort us. Comfort our hearts and our minds. Remind us that you're still on the throne and you always will be. 
We thank you, Jesus, for your life and the suffering that you went through for our life. In Jesus' name we pray this. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. We couldn't think of anything better to do in, as we've talked about suffering and that what Christ can do when he's in us, healing our broken jars and, and restoring us and doing great things in us, is to remember the suffering of Christ. Here at Bethel, we believe that you can receive communion simply if you have a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to be a member here. We just ask that you have a relationship with Jesus. He's the one who gave himself on the cross, gave his life, he was broken for us, and he did that so that you and I might have wholeness and healing and eternal life. Just like what Melanie said is that, you know, we die, but then we live. There is hope beyond death. There's hope in this life, even right here, right now, through Christ. So would you bow your head with me? Because I want to give everybody the opportunity to receive these elements. And perhaps today you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. This is your moment, your opportunity to receive him into your life. I'm gonna pray a simple prayer. And this prayer needs to come from your heart. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my past. I choose you. Would you be my treasure? Help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'm telling you, there's a party going on in heaven right now for you. There's excitement going on for you. And I'm telling you, we want to connect with you. And so we're going to just have up on the screen for the next few moments uh, a number that we would love you to text. And it says, and we just want you to text the word believe. And we want to do that to encourage you and, and grow you in this process. And if you did pray that prayer, let us know. We want to know and we want to encourage you along the way. I'm going to ask the ushers to come and they're going to prepare to serve you and we're going to take the elements. We're going to pass them all the way across uh, the rows here. And what we're going to ask you to do is when you receive your elements, if you'll hold on to them and then we're going to read a passage of scripture and then we're going to uh, receive the elements together. And let's just be in an attitude of worship and prayer. For I spoke a word you were singing over me You've been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night and I couldn't earn Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God before he was crucified he had a 
supper with his disciples. And this moment comes from there where Jesus speaks to his disciples and he talks about how his body will be broken and his blood will be shed so that people might have wholeness and healing and forgiveness of their sins and have entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Not because of their deeds, but because of their faith in Jesus. And the disciples passed this along to those that chose Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And we read this out of 1 Corinthians. It says this, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you'll take the wafer in your hand and let's begin to pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you would send your son. That his body would be broken. And in his brokenness, we are made whole. There is a treasure in our jar because of the brokenness of Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your gift. And Lord, I pray for those that need healing. I pray, Lord, as we remember the broken body of Christ, that there would be healing that would be instilled in people's lives and bodies right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that as we receive this element, may we remember and never forget his broken body. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take. If you hold the cup in your hand, it says, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. It's a new promise in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you hold the cup in your hand? And let's pray. Jesus, thank you that your blood was shed. You are the perfect, pure, spotless lamb. And because of your one and final sacrifice, everything that we would ever do wrong is forgiven and forgotten when we choose a relationship with you. We say thank you for this new promise that we are not bound to the sufferings of this world, but we are promised an eternal hope and an eternal life through your sacrifice. Thank you for your suffering. May we never forget it. May we honor you as we receive this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take God, you are good. Come on, just your own way, begin to thank him. God, you are so good. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We honor you. In Jesus' name. Before we close, it's one of our greatest privileges as pastors of the church to pray over you. And we have that privilege and we see in the word of God that we have the power to bless or the power to curse by our tongue. And I wanna bless you today. And so would you stand with me and I wanna pray a blessing over you. And before I close in praying, praying this blessing over you, I understand that there may be some of you that you're in the midst of suffering and I know Melanie prayed for you, but if you need somebody to stand with you in prayer, I'm gonna invite our prayer team to come and they're gonna be up towards the front here. And I wanna pray a blessing over you. But as I pray that blessing, if you just need somebody to stand with you in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your suffering, or there's something going on, I want you to know that I have my friends here. They're gonna pray with you and stand with you and encourage you in prayer. You're not alone. That's why God put us together in this family called church. And we pray that you'll be able to stand and know that there's others standing with you and the very presence of God. Let me pray a blessing over you. And if you need more prayer, please come and join my friends up front. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you that there are treasures in our jars of clay. Thank you, God, that in the midst of our brokenness, you restore, you heal, you uplift. And Father in heaven, I pray for everyone within the sound of my voice. I pray that your face shine upon them. Give them peace. Give them rest. Lord, I pray for their homes, their businesses, their places of work, that they be filled 
with your incredible and glorious presence. And Lord, I pray for their children and their grandchildren, that they'll walk in your goodness, walk in your favor, and walk in a relationship with you all the days of their life. And Lord, as we leave this place, may we know that our suffering is just for a moment, because God, you have so much for us. And Lord, I pray that we'll live these things out. We'll declare that you are our treasure and our broken clay jars. So God, as we leave this place, may we honor you and bless you in everything that we say and everything we do. In Jesus' name, we all say amen, amen. If you need prayer, come forward. God bless you. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here next week.